the, the first saint we're going to talk about is uh, uh, Saint Faustina, and <clears throat> we have her relic here. So one of my Polish priests was able to go to Krakow uh, and to the Basilica and to get this relic and then he bought the relic card to go with it. And it's really, very, very uh, beautiful. They do a wonderful job. And for the kids, the, the relics are <clears throat> three different classes. So the first class is a relic of actually, usually, Part of the rib of the person and we we do that to uh, honor them and to also recognize them as being someone that is with God so a saint a saint and uh, usually uh, depending on the saint uh, God reveals to us that they the person is with them in heaven by having a miracle happen in their name. And so as I talk about St. Faustina, I'll talk about the, the miracle that happened uh, in her name. And we'll do the same thing with uh, uh, Father Stanley Rother, who is now St. Stanley Rother. And he is a martyr. And so that's the other way that we uh, recognize saints in our lives. Uh, and some of the martyrs, of course, have miracles that are attributed to them. So getting back to the relic, relics, the first class relic is usually a, a little small bone that, that is part of the person themselves. And then the second class relics are usually things that they have uh, touched or worn or those kind of things. And then the third class relic is usually something that has touched those things. And so we have a number of third class relics over here that Terry has been really kind enough to, to order for us, and thank you for doing that. And I think they're available for the families to take. Uh, so these are relics of the various saints that are there, and it's usually, a third, those are all third class, so they have touched something that the saint had touched, something like that, okay? So we begin really with uh, uh, Saint Faustina, and uh, kids, for each of you, just to know, uh, the, the lives of the saints are lives just like us. And sometimes there's things that happen in their lives which aren't according to plan. So uh, she was born, Saint, she was born uh, Helena Kowalska, and she was born in 1905, on August 25th. So 1905, uh, and so at the turn of the, the 20th, the beginning of the 20th century, really. And her family was extremely poor, and they lived on a farm, uh, and her uh, father was called Stanislaw, and her mother Mariana, and he was a carpenter, and they were considered peasants at the time. And so a peasant would be a person who is really, really poor, and uh, really uh, lived a very simple life, but they lived also a very religious life. And so that's where she learned how to pray, that's where she learned how to uh, really participate in Mass, and, and her love especially of the Blessed Sacrament, which is the body and blood of Jesus. That's where she came to love that. And she. She actually only had about three or four years of, of a formal education in school, but she was taught by her uh, mother especially. And at the ripe old age of seven, she, she had a, a sense that she wanted to enter the convent to become a sister. And of course her parents said to her, not yet, not yet. Uh, and so kids, same thing, if your parents are saying to you, not yet, that's why. They're saying you need some more time, you need some more time. But in, in uh, 1924, at the age of 18, uh, uh, she 
had a, a, a kind of a sense of Jesus uh, really beginning to speak to her in her life. And the call, therefore, to enter religious life really got strong. And so she, she, she left her little small town that she was in in Poland and uh, went to Warsaw, which is at that time a pretty good sized city, with only the dress she had on. That's it. Which is an amazing moment. Uh, and she stopped off at St. James Church in Warsaw and met a priest and just asked him his advice. And he connected her with a, a, a lady there who was a local woman he found trustworthy and uh, until she found a convent to be a part of. So she didn't even have an idea which convent she was going to. Uh, she just went. And uh, after visiting quite a number of convents and uh, being told, no, not yet, or no, that's not going to work, uh, she met the sisters uh, of the congregation of Our Lady of Mercy in Warsaw. And that's really where uh, she uh, was beginning to be accepted. But the Mother Superior told her that in order to enter, she had to be able to pay for her religious habit. And so she actually went to work to get enough money to be able to buy her religious habit. And after a time, uh, she was received into uh, the convent at the age of 20. And uh, she took the name of Sister Maria Faustina, and the reason she did, because she had a special devotion with one of the martyrs of the church, uh, St. Faustinus, who died in the year 120, and he was a martyr, meaning he gave his life for Christ. And that's what she wanted to do, give her life for Christ. And so the name Faustina is Faustinus in for uh, a woman. And so she entered the, the novitiate and took her first vows in, in 1928. Now remember, historically, that's after World War I. The, the crash, the great crash, took place already of the stock market. And then it's right before World War II. Okay? Context for you. And so... Uh, in, in Poland, she, she had a number of different assignments with the, the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. Um, and some of them were in some of the small towns in Poland. Uh, so why don't we, this is a picture, by the way, of her family, uh, her parents, and we, we either think it's grandparents on the other side or other family members. We're not sure at this point. Let's go to the next one. All right, and that's a picture of her after her final vows that she took. But she served as a cook, she served as a gardener, she served in a lot of different simple ways for the community. Uh, and then in 1930, she was diagnosed as having tuberculosis. And so she was um, asked to go to recover in one of the convents that was in one of the little small towns in, uh, my, my Polish is terrible, it's P-L-O-C-K. I want to say that's Plock, but anybody else have a better way to say it, let me know, okay? And it's really uh, in that time frame that she, she continued to have really a, a, a sense of Jesus speaking to her, and uh, it was there that she, she had really the very first uh, experience of Jesus as the Divine Mercy, and I think we've got the Divine Mercy here, yeah, as the Divine Mercy. So it was a vision that she had of Jesus, and um, uh, the, with the vision, she had a sense that Jesus was saying uh, uh, that to us to pray, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And there was a, a connected with that was a promise that the soul that venerated this image would not 
parish. In other words, devotionally honoring Jesus. And of course, this is a moment of the sacred heart of Jesus. And we see from the image that we've got both red, red rays, white rays, and blue rays, too, that are part of it. And so the graces of God coming from Jesus and his, his precious blood, uh, baptism, and, and also the grace of Our Lady at the same time. So we have all three. Um, and she took her final vows then in 1932 uh, and um, continued to serve in the community in very simple ways. Uh, and the visions continued for her. Uh, and uh, uh, the, her, her, her uh, confessor, one of the priests, uh, uh, Father uh, Sopoko, he had her go to a psychiatrist to see if she was on the level or not. And the psychiatrist said, she's on the level. And so from that moment on, he became a tremendous supporter of her and also of the image of the divine uh, mercy. Uh, and so, you know, in her own visions, she had a sense of Jesus saying to her that the divine mercy really needed to be honored, both in the chapel where she was, but in also the local church, and eventually that the Holy Father would honor uh, the divine mercy. And she had a sense as she she began to really uh, uh, meditate on the vision she had with Jesus, also of the chaplet of divine mercy, which is a simplified form of the rosary, but also which, which calls in uh, the, the threefold mercy of God. So the mercy uh, to trust in Christ's mercy, the mercy to show others, and the call for us individually to receive God's mercy. Um, and she actually began to write the rules that she wanted to have for her own religious community built on the divine mercy. Uh, and she never was able to have that fulfilled uh, because the illness really began to take toll on her. Uh, and she had a, one of her final visions was Jesus saying to her, my daughter, do what is with, what is in with do whatever is within your power to spread the devotion to my divine mercy. I will make up for your lack. And that's actually what ended up happening. We learned from from her uh, diary uh, that her uh, her vision of the divine mercy and the novena to divine mercy. Uh, really was a basic part of her spiritual uh, life. And the illness began to continue to uh, take the toll on her, and at the age of 33, she died on October 5th, 1938, in Krakow. Uh, and, of course, uh, she's buried now in Krakow's uh, Basilica of the Divine Mercy. And that's actually where we got the relic from. And I sent one of my Polish priests who speaks a lot of Polish much better than I do by far. And he was able to get that uh, with my signature, but also his wonderful Polish to the Polish sisters. Um, it was uh, Archbishop Carol Wotila, who uh, in a very real way uh, was moved by her and moved by the divine mercy. And he became, of course, Pope Saint John Paul II. And through him and through Pope Benedict the 15th or 16th, sorry, the divine mercy Sunday has been declared and of course, it was Pope St. John Paul II that declared her 
a saint. Um, just a footnote, there was a, 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 a lady uh, called Maureen Deegan in Massachusetts who had uh, um, an illness which caused her to retain fluids such that she eventually had to have one of her legs amputated and she had been operated on like 10 times, so really suffered a lot. And um, she prayed at uh, Sister Faustina's tomb uh, for healing. And she said she heard a voice say to her, ask for my help and I will help you. And at that very moment when she prayed, the, the pain that she felt went away. And when she came back to the United States and was tested by all kinds of doctors, her illness was completely gone, completely gone. So that became a miracle on behalf of St. Faustina. So I'm going to pause there and just ask, do you have any questions you want to ask or anything that uh, before I get to uh, St. Stanley Rother? Yes, ma'am. So, you know, even today, uh, we have God working in people's lives. We have Mary working in people's lives, Mary the mother of God. Um, uh, but there's also a need for us to do our due diligence to make sure that the person is on the up and up and the person is really on track uh, with their spiritual relationship, because all this is really spiritual. Um, and so that's why the church actually takes time to declare people saints. Uh, so Pope St. John Paul II was actually on a fast track to sainthood, but even that took over five years. Same thing with uh, uh, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She was on a fast track, but it took five years. Uh, and again, it's researching their lives, it's checking with the family if they're still alive, or friends, or any kind of uh, uh, material they wrote, or anything like that. And so the question for, for St. Faustina was really, because this was such a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, was it a real experience? And so the church took quite a number of years until Pope St. John Paul II became Pope, really. So she died in 38, and he was Pope again for 25 years, but still, in that time frame, there's a whole bunch of time. Of course, World War II happened, the Korean War happened, we had all kinds of stuff happening. And it wasn't until the, the church... Uh, committee on saints was able to go through her life, her visions, and her diary especially, and say, yes, she is a saint. And this miracle that I just told you about helped immensely in it. So I hope that helped with it. So the church is very careful. Uh, just because a bishop recommends a person to be a saint doesn't mean that's going to happen. And there's a process of that taking place. Uh, we have one going on right now. Sister Thea Bowman, who was in Jackson area, so Mississippi, is in the process of hopefully being named a servant of God, which is one of the first steps towards sainthood. But it's also a process. And so, okay, does that help? Very good question, excellent. Any other questions like that on, on yes ma'am? So it depends on the circumstance. Uh, so like with uh, St. Stanley Rother, no miracle was needed, but we still needed to check his life. And because he was martyred. Uh, now with St. Faustina, they needed to check her writings and they needed to check her really development in her relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, Pope St. John Paul II actually 
uh, well, actually it was, it was Benedict XVI that named her a doctor of the church, which is really even more special to the church because of the divine mercy image, but the chaplet especially, the chaplet. Uh, because praying the chaplet is really the threefold invitation to God's mercy. And that's a teaching, and as a teaching, she's considered a doctor of the church. St. Therese of Lisieux, who died young also, same thing, because her little way of living the faith has become a teaching for the church. So anytime some of the saints have been, and it's, it's rare to be named a doctor of the church, very rare, very rare. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila, um, I'm naming all women now, St. Augustine, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, I can go through a, a longer list, but all of those uh, would be considered doctors of the church. So great question. So St. Stanley Rother, I actually happened to be at the mass where he was proclaimed as a martyr of the church and a saint of the church in Oklahoma City uh, as a bishop. And so that was one of the joys. And I, had, I wrote Bishop, uh, Archbishop Coakley to get this particular uh, image. And these two are the ones that are traveling around the diocese right now. The other images we have up here are the other saints that are here, plus the others that are in the, in the chapel. These stay here. These are part of our reliquary at St. Patrick's School. The diocese has 2,000 relics. Say that again. The diocese has 2,000 relics, and we're still in the process of working through all of those with the paperwork that comes with them, because there's there's usually documentation of their authenticity. In other words, it's not just some some bone somewhere. It's actually the same themselves. So Saint Stanley Rother, he was born. Uh, Stanley Francis Rother on March 27, 1935. So he's right before St. Faustina passed away. Uh, and he, he grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, a farming town. Uh, and his uh, parents' names are Francis and Gertrude Rother, whom I had a chance to meet. Uh, and really very sweet, and it was obvious that he, he grew up in a family that was really, really de dedicated to the faith. And uh, uh, he, he, and this, this is for the kids, he wasn't the, the strongest student, okay? But he still had that deep faith and desire to follow Christ. Um, and he when he uh, decided that he wanted to enter the seminary and to follow Christ, um, he initially went to one of the local seminaries and he flunked out. So he couldn't handle the Latin at the time. And uh, the bishop, though, listened to him carefully, discerned with him, and in discerning with him, heard that there was a vocation there. And so he allowed him to go to Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, um, Maryland. So in 1963, he was ordained a priest, uh, May 25th. And I had to place that in time for, for me. Uh, I was just about to enter the seminary myself in 1966. Uh, so we are a little bit on the peers level. Um, and then he, he served as a priest for a while uh, in Oklahoma, but he still he felt a deep call to be a missionary. And so he, he went to serve in the mission they had in uh, Aptitlan uh, in Guatemala. And uh, um, it, it really touched his heart, big time. Uh, and he was, I think, radically changed. And 
I can relate to that. My first assignment as a priest was in our mission in Mexico. So I served in Saltillo for a while, and then I served in Arteaga, which is near Monterrey in Mexico. Uh, and it, it gets into your heart, and it never leaves. And so he uh, stayed there as a, a priest to serve. Uh, in fact, he, he learned the local language, not just Spanish, uh, but uh, he, he learned the language of the people there. Uh, and let me see if we've got it here. He actually had the Bible translated uh, into, uh, it's called Tutsutil. And he helped the farmers co-op and he really worked with the schools and he helped to set up a hospital clinic there and uh, he set up, set up a Catholic radio station there. Uh, he, he really dove in to the people and really gave his life for the people. So much so that he was considered by them their priest, their priest. And they had not had a vocation there from that particular area in 250 years, which is breathtaking. So I'll talk about that a little later in this. So his, his zest for life, his zest to serve the people was really something that touched him. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And he, he, he really took on the spirit of being a missionary priest in a big way. But then the war began to break out in Guatemala. And uh, it really became super dangerous for uh, the priests especially to be there. They were trying to kill off all the leaders of the different communities. Uh, and so there was a point where the, the diocese really asked him to come back to Oklahoma uh, and to uh, wait and see what would happen with the war. But the, he came home, and when he came home, he, 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 he could not lose the sense of wanting to be the shepherd of the people in Atitlan. And, and more and more he felt the call from Christ to go back and be there with the people and to serve the people. Uh, and so he, he uh, eventually uh, prevailed upon the bishop to let him go back. So he went back and uh, to the great joy of the people. And the people really, really rallied around him and, and uh, uh, were there for him. But one particular morning, very early, uh, they, they think it's some of the folks from the army, but they don't know for sure. People came, and there was a, quite a, a fight that broke out in the rectory uh, of the, the town, uh, and of the church. And uh, at the end of the fight, uh, he was killed. Uh, and that moment was a significant shift for the people of the area because they all said the same thing they have killed our priest they have killed our priest uh, now rather than them taking up a battle cry in terms of taking up arms they actually had a battle cry of faith powerful faith in that moment um, such that when his body was brought back to the United States to be buried the people of the area asked for his heart to stay there at the church. And that's where he, his heart is buried because that's where his heart was in a special way. And so he's, he's, he is buried now in Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, they're going to be building a basilica over the burial site, so for him. Um, but as I was sharing with you, there had not been any vocations from that particular parish in 250 years. There have now been 10 young men ordained priests, and then there's, an, there's another 10 in the seminary right now. It was a call to arms, but in faith. And it was his faith 
that spoke so loudly uh, to the, the people. Uh, just a little footnote, his, his first Mass as a priest was in 1963 uh, at uh, Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Orchard, Oklahoma, and he was killed on July 28, 1981, in the church rectory in Guatemala. I'm trying to think. I think I was the pastor of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Alice, Texas at that time. So time frame, just as a footnote. Uh, so he is a saint by being martyred for the faith and giving his life for Christ, which is a little different than what happened for St. Faustina. She gave her life for Christ, but she was not martyred. She died from uh, tuberculosis, but her life spoke sainthood, and that's why the church was able to declare her a saint. A saint. So any questions now on uh, our dear, our dear, uh, that's a picture of him. And I think we got another one. And uh, Pope Benedict, I'm sorry, Pope Francis, uh, and uh, the image of, uh, was presented the image of St. Uh, Stanley uh, Rother. Uh, and of course, he was named a saint recently also by Pope Francis. Wonderful, wonderful. Any other questions? Bishop, are they doing anything with Father Quinn from Saltia? Because I just think he was a living saint. Uh, they aren't moving on his yet because there's another priest that they're working with there. So he's kind of in line for Father Quinn. And there's a number of other uh, saints so just from the point of view of the bishops of the United States, when we have someone that's local, we, we need to do our research first as bishops. Uh, and then we submit it to the bishops of the country, so of the United States. So all the bishops vote on whether the person should continue in the process of sainthood. And so we we then recommend to the Holy Father and to the committee of bishops in Rome that they be named servants of God first. And then once a miracle happens, they begin to move into being blessed and then being saints. Uh, and if they're martyred, then it's super fast track, as you can tell, super fast track. Yes, ma'am. It's a little unusual, but because of the circumstances, the church allowed that one. And then the relics are usually taken from one rib bone. So the bodies are generally tried, we try to keep them intact completely, but the relics are from one rib bone. And usually uh, from one small rib bone, they can have a tremendous number of relics that the, the world needs to be able to honor the folks that have gone before us that are with God in heaven. Uh, and that's to give us hope that one day we can share eternal life with them, with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and uh, have the love of God just flowing over us every day. And the light of Christ lighting our way every single day. I mean, it's a gift. So great question. Any other questions that you've got? All right, so Terry, if you'll come up, I'm going to bless them with uh, St. Faustina's brother. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession of St. Faustina, may Almighty God bless each and every one of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, you're welcome to come by the table. Terry has provided third-class relics of 
quite a number of saints that we have here. And then all of them have a story, and so that's one of the moments I'll say to the kids, you can Google it. <laughs> you can Google it. And then I'm available to answer any questions you have about the saints we have up here, too. Okay? God bless y'all tonight. Thank y'all for coming.